Cool. Um, thanks, thanks, Suho, for the intros. Um, um, it's taken the 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 task of 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 um, explaining who we are and what we do um, kind of out of my hands. So it's, that's nice. I don't have to bother doing that part. But yeah, uh, what um, what Suho has kind of uh, mapped out there are the are the set of um, concrete links between. Um, myself, Ash and Kashif, uh, which which give you some indication as to as to why us three are um, are here this evening to kind of close out your your program um, and why we're 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 why why we're arranged in this particular way. So yeah, as 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 um, Suhail said, um, Kashif Ash and I have concrete links through either the 87 Press, Dark Matter, or publications we've put out together or projects we've been involved in together. Um, but those, those concrete links are really only a kind of um, surface appearance of something much, much broader that's going on uh, between us. And not only between us, but between others as well um which which say that the the those 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 concrete outputs uh um whether it's the article whether it's materials and events with 87 press or even actually um ash and i were founding members of a black study group in london which set up around 2013. um, um those those concrete kind of outputs are really just a a product of a a much longer uh deeper kind of i guess a polite way of putting it would be discourse um taking place between us but the the more the more um the more accurate description is something like chatter that we're 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 constantly um chattering um and that chattering kind of dva it's it doesn't really follow any um kind of uh um prefigured path yes. um but it is it is um uh, it's always it's incessant it's constant but um having said that the 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 chatter between us there are you can pick out some some kind of shared themes or, or again, themes is perhaps a polite way of putting it. You could, you could perhaps call them like obsessions or kind of uh, uh, ticks that always reappear in amongst our chat. So I just kind of briefly kind of map those out. I mean, the, the, um, I said the first, I'd say the first theme or obsession is, is you could call it the, uh, the aesthetics and politics of race. Um, but but calling it the aesthetics and politics of race is a kind of, um, again, a very neat way of putting it or a, or a, or a kind of red herring, because that implies, well, there's an aesthetics of race, there's a politics of race, and what we're interested in is bringing the two together into some sort of uh, uh, combined kind of um, um, mutation. But actually, what we're more interested in is is the very notion that paying attention to race exposes or reveals the already constitutive impurity of aesthetics and politics, that they're not separable. Um, that, that, that actually thinking through race means that aesthetics and politics as separable, ca separate categories, uh, that, that's, that, that type of separation begins to collapse very quickly. Um, I guess the second theme that uh, that links us is you could you could put under the heading of poetics, uh, but poetics here is 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 not simply poetics as poetry as language, but poetics thinking through sound and music, through image, a particularly film work, and um, I guess a kind of uh, um, the social dimension of poetics. Is a is a concern for us, and the third concern I'd say is is or theme is theory. Um, we're um, um, uh, unapolog unapologetically committed to theory, 
um, it doesn't, it doesn't, we don't feel like we have to apologize for, um, for um, talking about theory as the basis for thinking about the aesthetics and politics of race and, and uh, poetics in the, in the broadest sense. And so if you, if you kind of drill down deeper into that chatter, um, really what it's, it's what it, what's at its core and what that chatter is a reflection of or a kind of emanation of his friendship. So in effect like that, that the, 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 the concrete projects we put out are a product of, of, of um, a friendship that we've had for, for several years now. And um, yeah, and we try our best when we work together, talk together, or when we perhaps do events like this is to, is to bring some element of that friendship and that chatter through uh, to kind of, uh, uh, to, to show it live, happening live as it were. Um, so with that in mind, what we decided to do for today or this, this, this evening is to just um, keep things quite simple and light touch um, uh, um, as it were. And um, really what we're gonna do is gonna show you a short film, a short 10 minute work by an artist we're all kind of interested in. Um, yeah, the film is about 10 minutes and then we'll each respond to it. So Kashif will go first, then Ash, then we'll return to me. Um, we'll try and keep our kind of responses and thoughts very short because then what we really wanna do is then have a conversation with you all with Sahel, with with um, um, and um, with all of the all the people here, so um, I'm not going to introduce the film because I think Kashif will, will fill us in a bit more on the on the on the detail of the film. But it's by an artist called called Klein, and it's a film called Mark. Now, just two things, just to signal. Firstly, what you might hear as kind of distorted sound is a part of the work, so don't worry about that. About adjusting kind of sound levels or anything along those lines. And there's a long break in the work where the audio, as, a way, as it were, cuts out or disappears. So again, when, when you get to the point where the audio cuts out, don't, be, don't worry, that's not a technical failing with, with Zoom or whatever, that's just in the work itself. Um, so I'll just, uh, I'll just share my screen and, um, and, uh, um, and uh, play the work for you and then Kashif will take over from there. If someone, once I start playing, if someone just puts their thumbs up to say that the audio is fine, then that'll be really helpful.
Okay, Kashif, all yours, mate. Okay, great. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, cheers. Okay, so um, the Klein video, um, it's effectively, she's kind of referring to and reflecting on the murder of Mark Duggan in 2011. Um, hence it's called Mark. Um, and what you see in that, in the navigation, that Google Maps navigation is um, the Broadwater Farm Estate, which was where Mark Duggan was from, where he grew up. Um, and what she does, she takes you to where he was shot, to Ferry Lane. Um, and so you're kind of retracing um, the geographies um, of, of, that, of that vicinity. And then in the soundtrack, what you're getting is um, kind of a, a typical Klein um, kind of she's warping and she's abstracting. Um, and in particular, she's looking at some of the um, she's using some of the speeches from the memorial events that they have every year. Uh, and so there's a moment when he says, oh, let's have a, there is a minute of silence or two minutes of silence, whatever it is. Um, and then that's that's when the silence kind of comes about. Um, and like what I want to kind of think about is really in terms of the question of urban poetics um, and, and the way that we can explore kind of race, embodiment, abstraction. Some of the stuff that Dan has already really kind of mentioned and talked about. Um, and I'm going to go down one route and then I think each of us are going to have slightly different routes that we go down. So I'm going to think about this poetry collection, um, Duppies, which is um, written by theorist and poet D.S. Marriott. Um, and it teases out a lot of, a lot of these ideas. Um, and in particular, it's an engagement with crime. Um, and it should be noted that um, Skepta and JME, kind of quite well-known grime artists, we both grew up um, in, in the Tottenham area and not far um, from the Broadwater, Broadwater Farm estate. So there is, there's like a concrete link there as well as um, a conceptual one that I'm gonna tease out. Um, so what I'll do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna read um, the preface of the book um, and then you can get some of the concerns of, of what it's about, um, some of the, the language and yeah, just some of the content and so on. So here we go. The so preface, 16 bars. Um, grime is late shift, zero hour. It makes a beeline for bare life, but what it lays bare leaves everyone cold. 
grime is the thread that links Afro-pessimism to Afrofuturism, but its role proceeds without ties or duplicity. Grime is post-work and post-Brexit. Its rhythms respond to the necessity in which I exist. See these wheels. They may be brand spanking new, but under the bonnet, there is fear and anguish. Grime is last orders, a mugging made up by thefts, an ev evocation stripped down to the bone. It expels pagans with a fierce rigor and method, which only the coldest excel. Grime is disjunctive, a useless meditation on parataxis. Think of the absolute having to earn its living, but finishing up with hardly anything at all. Grime is payback for N-words and Asbergs. It has dominion, but no license for each dissolve is charged with an Asberg. It makes music from a manner that is not me, but what it gives has neither use value nor beauty. Grime is a medium of the unknown, it refuses everything but possibility. Its violence is one without immunity, but it's real, it's dispossession, and it's inconsolable without knowing it. I mean, there's, there's a lot to talk about there, but one of the interesting things that he's doing is, and throughout the book, is he's deploying these exact deft um, critical terms. Um, which is, you can argue, is employing from his him, from his theory hat, um, but he's allowing it and entangling it into a more capacious um, rendering, shall we say? So, um, like what you can see it in some way in terms of he's using these uh, modernist contemporary uh, contemporary poet, poet poetic terms and form. Um, and it's encountering um, effectively what would usually be termed a kind of everyday street form. I say usually because I think um, what he what, what then he does is it, it kind of decomposes that or, or decompose, discomposes, shall we say. Um, and, and what we see is like later on in, in part three um, of the book, um, there's an engagement with the lyric subject vis-a-vis -vis embodiment. So there's a street philosopher called Rav. Um, and the, the narrator, the main character, the author, is, is effectively using Rav to, to think about sexual and social life. Um, and it, those two come together for him. And then within them two is is what we can think about in terms of racial embodiment. Um, and so one of the things that like, is really going on, and I think this is, you know, if I circle back to Klein, is there's a, there's a breaking down around the critic and the artist. There's a breaking down between maybe what would might be considered the anthropologist and the producer, the sociologist, and, and the poet, shall we say. So there's this kind of like movement going on. Um, and it's going on, interestingly for Klein, it seems to be going on literally on the streets, or at least that's the, that's the interesting thing with that film, with, that, with Mark. Uh, these digitized streets are kind of bubbling and, you, and there's a thing that you can kind of, you can feel the, the racial violence or you can hear it. Um, but it's not it's not direct. It's been processed. It's been sedimented. It's 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 under the facade, right? And so, and it's being mediated. So, like between kind of, shall we say, this kind of racist violence and cultural production is is something like poetics, or poetics at the edge. Um, and with that, I want to I want to pull in um, actually this publication that I've been working with on with Ash and with um, a fellow poet, Azad Sharma. Um, and it's called Suburban Finesse. And we're really looking at both the outer city, but also kind of sub as in under the city. Um, it's a joint pamphlet um, collaboratively written. So it's our way of kind of trying to deform the, the authorship and so on, the, auth the singular author. Um, so I just want to read from the from the introductory notes of that. The problematic is a limit. 
at a limit and an opening, a spacing, a gap, a fissure, almost nothingness in which poetic language delimits, non-being oppositional to the urban disaster, a collective nothingness that erupts in the temporal logics of para-coloniality, to after the end, finitude and the infinite, transversing the histories, collective memories of loss, death, trauma, life, joy, sociality, hiding in the light, an elegiac lament as nothingness, invisibility, the imperceptible demand and refusal for opacity in the lightness of being, post-colonial madness as a twisting spiral, a vortex of dense poetics after the end, at the edges of urban control and violence. Here are some entangled traces of improvised thoughts, and as all poetics mourning and futurity, a broken lyricism for a suburban fugitivity. And with that, I want to pass on to Ash. Oh yeah, how are you doing? Good, good evening. Um, uh, thanks, first of all, Sahel for uh, inviting us. Uh, and thank also um, Dombe for inviting us as well. Uh, to have the conversation, as um, Dumbe said, uh, I think the, the sorts of um, issues and that we're kind of interested in, in terms of questions of race, blackness, coloniality, racial capitalism, the decolonial, it can't be thought by yourself. It can't be thought, I would even say it can't be thought within the sort of um, the official parameters of the institution called the university or even the art gallery and in some senses our friendship transverses all those things works in those different spaces and and, and but comes together and, and we're kind of i think constantly having to rethink what we think so it's in that in that sense i just want to really just add a bit to the conversation so we can have a further conversation about these things um thank you to chief in terms of um I think one of the things that Dunbar said, we're kind of very interested and, and think it's necessary at this moment to think questions of race and blackness and coloniality through the importance of uh, poetics and the aesthetic. So that's, um, and uh, Sahel did introduce the joint article that me and Dunbar wrote. So partly um, I'm just gonna summarize two or three key bits from the article that gives a little bit of a, a context for our sort of argument in thinking through the centrality of something that we wouldn't really call aesthetics, actually, as as um, as, as Dunbar has suggested, it's porous. Um, you know, in old cultural studies language, something like cultural politics, but even that is problematic in terms of some of these uh, how they've evolved, etc. So, um, important figure for us, actually, a, a important one point of. Um, uh, focus is the figure Naam Chandler, who's written this um, singularly important book, I think, in terms of thinking about black culture. And Naam Chandler X, the problem of the Negro as a problem for thought. X, the problem of a Negro as a problem for thought. And it's it, for us, in one sense, that's our problem, is to think through, think through an idea of, um, think through um, the question of race and blackness and diaspora in a context of not just a political or social situation, but where the, the very languages that we inherit are always somewhat problematic to us. It's to think beyond the question of language itself and, and, and in a sense, open up to other sort of ways of thinking, doing together. Um, so what, what I'm gonna do as, as using client's video as a kind of trigger to think about a little bit more is to give it a, a slightly longer um, history, to locate it within a, I was gonna say tradition, but not really, within a, within a history of experimental black practice in Britain, which is partly what we speak about in the joint article that Dunbar and me wrote, uh, and, and trying to situate it there in terms of, um, in terms of, looking at this conjuncture to understand what was what, what article tried to do was trying to map out trying to map out a set of um debates across the atlantic that have been to and froing and as as sahel said 
rightly, is that we're quite influenced now. And we argue that some of the interesting work around kind of blackness, but actually the most, some of the most interesting work in theory at the moment, general, in terms of blackness, but generally in terms of thinking about something beyond our sort of um, present predicament, shall we say, predicament. It, it, it's coming out of America, out of black studies. And, and for, for what we've been um, thinking is not a kind of wholesale reproduction of that work, but to think through the histories in the UK of culture, thought and practice and art practice and look at how those, uh, and our article tries to give a, some sort of kind of warped map of how we sort of think we've got here, but in a way it's an open question to where we're at, but we ask the question at least. And I think the first thing to say about that history of, of, of looking at the Klein video as a singular piece of film is it has a longer history and a trajectory really, or versions of that film have made appearances in lots of other earlier texts of various kinds. And I, I would root it, and we would root it in, in particularly the development in black British art uh, in the 1980s. Um, and with it, within, in fine art, but all visual art, but also particularly in film and photography. Uh, and many of you will know that was a kind of, I think, a sort of paramount moment in terms of the, the rise of a certain set of practices that were black and British, we would argue. And in, 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 and in, in that sense, they, and they emerged, and, and I think it's important in, in terms of thinking about what happened at Broadwater Farm and the killing, and in Tottenham and the killing of Mark Duggan, is that there actually were some degree, not necessarily a response, but actually uh, that the art artwork and the uh, films, et cetera, came in a relationship to a certain kind of crisis in the British state and in nation, and particularly manifesting itself in, in the civil uprisings of 1981 and 1985, the, the big so-called race riots, et cetera. And, and they were national and they were quite, I mean, they were very significant and, and, and were a manifestation of a longer crisis of race in Britain, arguably at something that Britain hasn't, uh, the, the nation hasn't come to terms with the question of race as such, that uh, we, we arguably were actually in a worse situation than we were 30 years ago, but that's maybe worth thinking about a bit more further what that means, is that the crisis of race, I mean, directly for um, some like black filmmakers, for instance, and probably best known of that period, are uh, the Black Audio Film Collective, which is a workshop orientated collective, Sankofa, Chedo, they, in one way or another, made films that spoke to um, the history of Britain, the contemporary moment, and trying to situate it in the longer histories of, of the UK in terms of a crisis of race. There's direct references, for instance, to a very important book by uh, Stuart Hall and a number of his colleagues in the Birmingham uh, Centre for Cultural Studies uh, in 1978 called Police in the Crisis, which and Stuart Hall, a kind of important figure, we would argue in the, in the development of this experimental black practice in the 80s, Hall articulated that, that and it was interesting and important uh, to note that the crisis of the nation in the 70s was prefigured or understood through a very specific phenomena of, of mugging, which is related to a particular police uh, and media and national uh, uh, construction of black youth as, as a violent enemy within. And to some degree that policing is a common theme that actually runs through our very potted history here. Policing the crisis emerges in the context of policing, uh, as well as other co contexts. Because what, what Paul and others do is they say that the context of policing is, is actually is one way of a larger, a, a larger crisis in the nation, in the economy and the political, but it's manifesting itself in a very specific event in relation to the policing of young black youth in the so-called inner cities of the UK. And in, in that sense, the riots are also triggered by but both riots in 81 and 85, but also the riots, uh, the uprisings after Duggan's death, 
or all the uh, one common feature is the police as the kind of agent of the state, but also the front line of the nation and the racialization of 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 of, of a certain urban environment and and to some degree all, all three events three four events are, are also about the articulation of race and class and 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 the ability to us to think through the relation of race capital class and the nation and and to produce and find languages what the 80s was about was finding certain types of languages certain forms that could uh, call into crisis the so-called sort of established race relations social realism that has continued from the 80s up till now in terms of the kind of uh, anxiety and pathologization of migrants and that that has been consistently through uh, up till this period so the, the the, the, to Black Audio, uh, for instance, probably best known, and you, many of you um, uh, might have seen, for instance, Hansa Songs. Hansa Songs was made in 1986, and it was ostensibly a film uh, 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 triggered by the 1985 urban uprisings. But it's, a, it's an archival film, it's an essay film that tries, and it, it's an archival film that uses and tries to sort of create and give, to create spaces for other voices to be heard, but ghosts within the nation, those histories that are not being articulated, et cetera. And to some degree, that practice of the essay film, the archive film uh, has been quite an important trajectory in a sense to thinking about a certain experimental practice. Uh, I mean, the other group that isn't mentioned much is um, as part of this, uh, there were four main kind of black workshops. So uh, Black Audio, Sankofa and, and Chedo. And Chedo's work was called A People's Account. And The People's Account was, was actually a film about the, 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 the killing of Cynthia Jarrett, who used to live on the Broadwater farm. Right, and the film's about that. It was funded by the Ch Channel Four partly, and and um, but Channel Four have never shown it because it called the police as being institutionally racist, as terrorists, uh, and, and 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 kind of white institutional reproductive racism. So it's kind of interesting. It's now shown outside of sort of conventional broadcasting spaces, for instance. I just want to make a couple more points about the longer history, actually. I mean, the, uh, the other film I just want to draw attention to, and one of the important things about Black Audio's work is Black Audio Film Collective is the importance of sound. And I know Don will, will probably speak to that to some degree, is the importance of sound and the relationship of sound to visuals and the, and, and, and the sort of undoing of some of those categories. Of, uh, and, and the experimentation of sound and audio. And we can see this evident in a, in a different way in Klein's uh, film. Um, the other film that's worth, and I think in, uh, Klein's video is in dialogue to in some degree, in a kind of phantom dialogue, is uh, a film also made by the Black Audio Film Collective, Twilight City. And that was made in 1989 by uh, where John Acumfra were made hands of songs as part of the Black Audio Film Collective. Twilight City, less known in many ways, but it was made by Risa Geist as part of the Black Audio Film Collective. And it was very much also a sort of essay film that tries to map a, a sort of cartography of the shifting nature of capital and race in uh, London, particularly in relation to the gentrification uh, and the financialization of East London in various ways. So the film again is an experimental mode which uses degrees of personal voices, authoritative voices and certain type of uh, poetry to construct a certain kind of montage of a set of questions about the historical conjuncture. I was going to say a little bit more about our article but, but just, to, just to say what a method of working, if there's a method, is, and it comes from this article, and why we think, for instance, at this moment, there's a sort of, as Sahel sort of mentioned it, there's a sort of limit to the way that certain types of empirical orientated academic work has restricting the possibility of thinking otherwise. 
thinking beyond the sort of categories of neoliberal uh, capital, thinking beyond the neoliberal university, but also thinking beyond what we would call a sort of a, a, empiricism, a race relations empiricism that reproduces the very problematic ontology that we think art and poetry and poetics is, ha, has to address in, in a way beyond the language of, um, of, 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 of normative um, uh, social science. And I just quote a little paragraph. Uh, our contention is that the take up of U US black cultural thought and the arts and the edges of the, acad of the academy in the UK is, is the sign of an emergence of a more experimental speculative practice in a time where race allowances in the UK, while continuing to offer trenchant critique of racism, is unable to conceptualize the politics of contemporary blackness within the reductive orthodoxies of institutional methodologies and sociological empiricism." End of quote. I, I was going to go on and speak a, a bit about the Klein video, but I think we'll leave that to um, a, co a conversation which may, maybe other people have also other views. And, and, and just finally, just to, um, just to sort of um, slightly explain a little bit more about our thinking about and what is it from particularly the development of work in the US that I think has been useful to think through this present moment that we've been trying to. And it's just to sort of cl to clarify, and this comes from uh, an, a joint piece that we collectively wrote as a, as a Black Study Group. We wrote together for a conference initially, uh, um, a, a Black Studies conference, and, and we wrote a piece called um, The Movement of Black Thought study notes and it was uh, published in uh dark matter journal that sahel mentioned so you can go to it if you're interested uh, and and um and i just finished by this we understand blackness as a name given to the general antagonism one that operates as a dialectic between racial capitalism and black radicalism since the opening of the modern projects of racial slavery and colonialism we exhibit a tendency towards what some would call black aesthetics as they relate to the expression of the collective body in which that are not reducible in ways that are not reducible to the rational racial ontology of anti-racism. We're interested in black study, black aesthetics, as it reimagines experiments with, creates new forms of sociality, affect knowledge, and operates as a subjective mode of antagonism always escaping racial capitalism. This to us seems an imperative, given the inability of current black praxis to break out of the language forms and logics of neoliberalism, neoliberalism and its thought. Okay, thanks, I'll pass it on to Dombea. Cool, thanks, um, Ash and Kashif. I'll... Um... Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep things um, brief so we can get into conversation because you've heard, you've heard from me a bit already. But what I briefly wanted to do was also kind of riff, kind of riff off of both of um, Kashif and Ash's um, extensions of the Klein work and, um, and develop some kind of associations that are there in the work, whether they're conscious or not, intentional or not. Or not. Um, and yeah, that, the, the kind of riff I wanted to take is, is tied into the, the group that, um, and the project that um, Ash mentioned, the Black Audio Film Collective. Um, and, and their relationship to the Broadwater Farm Estate, which, which Kashif, as Kashif said, is where, is where the client work is filmed, and the client work is, 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 um, is, is, is a kind of is is organized around uh the the murder of mark duggan um as he left the estate to to uh, um, walk into tottenham um and as ash me mentioned the, the the murder of mark duggan can be can be um uh uh situated within a, a continuum of of um uh state or state directed killings um, that have a have a um, um, uh, are heavily racially inflected, 
And so that the what I wanted to point to with regards to that 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 um, that uh, the the space the 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 the, spe the site specificity of Broadwater Farm, should we say? Um, is to do with another figure in who was part of the Black Audio Film Collective, um, uh, uh, um, an artist, researcher, and writer called uh, Eddie George or Edward George, who was uh, a key, a founding member of the collective. Um, and um, Eddie has lived on the farm since the 1980s. So in a way, he was he was kind of the key figure for for ensuring that um, uh, the farm featured in a film such as Handsworth Songs. Um, and because of his own interests and his own uh, his own obsessions, in a way, he's he's one of the driving elements behind the audio aspect of Black Audio. But um, but um, since effectively since since Black Audio kind of uh, wrapped up in the in the late 1990s as a project and kind of transitioned to um, to uh, a different name, as it were, the name John Acomfra as a kind of singular artistic figure. Um, Eddie's kind of continued in his own obscured work, uh, relatively obscured work, um, his own kind of um, monastic work in the Broadwater Farm, and actually, you can see his 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 flat in the climb video. Um, it's 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 one of the buildings that's featured. And what what Eddie's done, I think, is is been doing is 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 kind of taking the core concerns of of Black Audio and then stretching them out and taking them to places which were not would not have been possible in the in that collective moment in the eighties. So in a way, he's extending and realizing possibilities, which just as 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 um, generative as those workshop projects were, that in effect he didn't have space to, to develop, and he's had to develop them on his own, and actually had to develop them without either the uh, the without the let's say the the institutional or economic support of of a formalized art market. Or higher education, it's been done relative in, in 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 as I said in a kind of obscurity, but it's starting to come to to fruition now or come come into view now. And really, um, it centres around Eddie's uh, relationship to dub, uh, to dub as a kind of. Um, not only a musical practice, and I'll talk about for those who don't know what the term dub means, I'll, I'll get on to explaining it in a minute. Not only as a musical practice or a musical project, but also as a kind of um, conceptual modality. So I just wanted you to, wanted to introduce you to two um, um, uh, areas of Eddie's work on dub that's coming out of Broadwater Farm. So the first is a series of photos. So I'm just going to briefly share my screen. He's a, he's he's developed a photographic practice where he takes images of the estate. Um, um, so so um, and this is a this is these are photos from a collection. Hopefully you can see these okay. Um, that he calls dub housing, right? Uh, which are images of and around. Uh, um, um, the the Broadwater Farm estate, um, and um, the second project that he's developed is is so what he's done he's taken the film essay which was the primary kind of um, uh, means of realization for for Black Audio, and he's transferred some of the energies of the film essay into a new medium, um, or for him a new medium. Or a, not a new medium as such, but a kind of a different medium, which is the radio essay. So you start developing a radio essay series um, that he calls uh, 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 the strangeness of dub, the strangeness of dub. So um, I'll put a link to uh, it's a it, at the moment it's it's a monthly series that appears on a Morley College Radio. Um, sorry, I'll just uh, I'll just I'll, I'll share the link in the chat. Um, and he's done seven shows so far, 
And the shows are not your usual kind of standard radio shows that you get on stations such as NTS or Balamy. It's not a selection of music. Each show is a presentation of a thesis. It's a presentation of a certain argument that he uses uh, music and particularly dub music as a means to construct and develop this argument. And so actually in, in, the, in the kind of show notes, he gives us a very neat um, uh, description of what dub is. So he says here, and I, just, I won't read the entire thing out, but um, I think it's worth, um, actually I might read the entire, because only three paragraphs, but because it, it gives you a good, good overview of what he understands dub to be. He says, dub is strange. A musical process and subgenre formed in the early 1970s and pioneered by Clement Dodd, Sylvan Morris, Lee Perry, King Tubby, scientist Jar Shaka, and the Mad Professor. Dub takes place through a kind of violence, an act of reducing archival audio documents to fragments and traces. Yet it is associated in its sound system context with communal rever reverie and meditative states. Actually, I won't read the whole thing through. But the, the, the thing to, to know is that when Eddie says dub is strange, and when he talks about the strangeness of dub, the strangeness here is a metonym for queerness. Okay, so the strangeness here is a metonym for queerness. So what he's doing, I think, is, and then if you think about the, the images I showed you, dub housing, another name for them could be queer housing. And I think in a way that takes us back to Klein, because if there's a, um, if there's a, if there's a, a um, aesthetic descriptor we could use to, to, to talk about Klein's practice, uh, her, her kind of aesthetic practice, it would be queer, I think. Or one of the ones that you could get into the work through, it would be this idea of queerness. But we're not talking about queerness here as a standpoint or a social position although I think it certainly uh, um, allows for that. I think the primary element of queerness in Klein is a, as a kind of modality, is as a kind of dub modality that, um, that Eddie's interested in. So um, I'll leave it there for now because uh, it's, uh, um, it's time to get into a conversation, I guess. Thank you. Um... Feels like one of those situations where I kind of want you guys to want you all to converse amongst yourselves for a bit. <laughs> it feels like you've got some things to say to each other. Um, I've, I've got a couple of questions and I don't know if, if other people do too. Um, do, do, do you want to respond to each other or? No, you go for it, man. Yeah. All right. Um, so I guess, uh, oh, okay, so I've got two questions, one of which is going to be par partly because the conversation is happening on a fine art program in a university. So I want to pick up some of the uh, comments about, you know, the, the insufficiency of the formal institutions and the kind of art structures to, to, get, to, to get to this notion of blackness that you're, you're all identifying. Um, but I was quite struck in the Klein video and in the way that Kashif took it up, particularly responding to it or, or yeah, developing it through, through the poems that the, you know, there's something kind of very sensual and textural in, in the, in, okay, so, so the piece is done through Google Maps or whatever, right? Um, so it's got the kind of like wireframe organization and corporatized Google's, Google-ness and so on. But the use of the, the kind of, um, yeah, kind, kind of, um, dub phrasing in the way that you were just describing it, Danvir, of the soundtrack. So you, you don't get a kind of coherent soundscape. It's not clear quite what the, the message is, but it kind of has effects and it kind of comes in and out, uh, which you can also hear in like dub in its, in its well understood form. Um, there's, there's a kind of, yeah, there's a kind of texture of the experience of going through, going through Broadwater Farm but it's obviously taking place through this like heavily mediated and, and aestheticized form. And I was interested in it um, in, as, as a contrast with say the forensic architecture piece or the forensic architecture investigation around Broadwater Farm, which you know, in some ways also uses computerized technologies and sort of framings and so on and so forth to kind of produce 
of forensics, which is to say an objectively organized view from nowhere or view from everywhere of, of Mark Duggan's killing. Um, and this piece uses some of the same media technologies, but does a completely different thing with it. It's a sort of mediatized, represented, experiential, subjective uh, positioning, and Mark Duggan's um, representation doesn't appear in it directly. Um, so it operates through the absence of the killing itself, but the whole piece is structured around it. Um, you know, and at the end, when it when you focus on the black kid and the white guy standing on that gantry, there's a sense of the kind of uh, qualitative, uh, the kind of qualitative sense of of what Tottenham is, um, and this this kind of like um, sort of messed up development that's going on in these in these areas in Haringey's under this like. You know, toxic toxic development scheme. So anyway, that that's all kind of a description of what what's what's um, what I saw saw in the piece. But I was interested in the way that I guess to tie it to what Ash was talking about blackness um, and maybe the kind of queerness you're identifying, Danvir. The way that um, what what's presented um, as blackness doesn't correspond to the sociology of blackness, right? So it's not like here are, here are some sort of black people in this category, you know, living on a housing estate and so on. And here are some white people living in a housing estate and here are some black people in the middle class living some distance away in Walthamstow, white people doing that and so on and so forth. And I think the critique of, I mean, I, I guess initially we probably need to unpack the empiricism um, thing that Ash was talking about a little bit and what's meant by that. But the, the, the way in which blackness is, is a kind of, um, disjointing or a kind of refusal of that sociological description of blackness. Um, and also kind of refutes like the empiric, the, the boxing of people into those categories, um, but kind of happens in the, in the sensual textual dimension and both through sound, through poetry, through the kind of visual organization of the space. So I think, I think I want to unpack that a little bit because it seems like that's, that's the point at which certainly literature, music, art could, can do some work to elaborate a notion of blackness. Um, but I guess one of the anxieties would be that you kind of lose contact with like, like the social materiality and economic uh, inequalities that, that blackness involves. Asha Kashif, I'll let you go first because I just spoke. Um, I, I could just start. Um, yeah, I mean that's the big question, right? That, that's like what uh, <laughs> uh, um, the. Um, I, th I think um, we we so the question of racial ontology, racism, is there, right? It hasn't gone away. It's still there. And it, it, I wouldn't say it's necessary for blackness, but it's the conditions in which blackness, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's beyond that, it's an excess of that, but it's also pre that as well. So blackness is, is a generative concept, but it, but it only operates in the social, actually. It's, a, it's, a, it's it in itself a sociality, right? So, so it, I suppose, takes the aesthetic, it takes us, as some degree, it starts to play around with the difference between aesthetics and art and the everyday. So, so um, the, the um, and hence we sort of trouble the category of the aesthetic, actually, in that sense. And, and, and in a sense, it's worth thinking about is in what sense then, for instance, is the Klein video operating at the level of blackness and maybe thinking about how that is very different to what forensic architecture is doing, actually, in a sense, because forensic architecture is just big data all it seems to be because it's about proving that he was well Klein already we already know the police killed him that isn't the starting point really so it's trying to you know the silence is interesting 10 minutes or nine minutes of silence it's, it's a sort of and, and then the sort of slightly at one point it looks like a computer first person shooter game targeting those people in silence you know so it's I think it's a sort of a it's a subtraction of social life to, in, in a sense from there to to show I mean, the, with the absence if, if anyone knows Tottenham the absence of social life is the striking thing 
about that sequence really and in a sense the silence is obviously a, 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 a place of reflection a place of um of, of a memorial memorializing but also a mourning of, of of death and social life and it is interesting that grenfell the way they responded to that the community responded to it was uh, you know monthly silent protests and they were silent and they were kind of much more impactful at the level of the silence in a sense so it's a sort of and 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 so i think that's interesting i mean i'm just making an observation interesting notting hill does this thing every year since it's been going until last year is um they have a two minute silence in the middle of the um the carnival and it has a poignancy not in itself but because it's in relation to the revelry and i think it's interesting that the silence is in the middle of the video between these different soundscapes and the protests of uh, no, no justice, no peace, for instance, etc. I think that, that, and I think I suppose I would say that's the source of materiality of blackness as a as a way of. I mean, it's interesting that the way of how it's working with digital technologies, black life is mediated. Like dub is a kind of mediated form of blackness in a sense. And so I think it's interesting, maybe the different technologies, the slightly poor image of the Klein video in the Hita Sturel sense, and as opposed to, and I'm just, you know, bouncing off the kind of sort of idealized aesthetic size eight, the sort of the neo-fascist aesthetics of uh, forensic architectures, sort of mimicry of, of, of and, and talk about seconds and stuff. It's all about measurement and quantification and about the representation in the end. It's about representation. And, and so it tells you nothing actually about Mark Duggan, why he died, who killed him, other than sort of as mere fact and has no history really. I'll shut up, I'll, that's I'll never working. Forensic architecture ever again, right? <laughs> um, I yeah, to. I'll just pick up on, yeah. pick up on um, the forensic architecture point. My, I mean, my thinking was really around, you know, the one thing that they position themselves is how do we do visual arts and, re and and research, and then they've kind of connected it through this kind of, as you say, this radical empir empiricism, shall we call it? Um, and actually, the Klein video does something does something else and you know she's kind of saying okay to to do research and to do and to be an artist you have to, you can you have to mediate it differently you, you, and in a way she's doing it through a kind of a, a larger idea of what art and aesthetics can be right so it's like it's, it, it's interesting because she can do it from the ground and yet it's still about the ground right and this is the kind of i think probably for a lot of students here it, that's the the double bind right around how do you do it from a position but also about the position right and so Dan did it quite said it quite nicely about modality um and I mean for me it was interesting like you know I was messing around with theory and so on for a while then I got to, to poetry and poetics and it was like a stripping back it was like, okay let's let, let's step back and let's, what, what do we feel here? And that doesn't mean let's take off our, our, our theoretical hats or our processing hats or whatever, because that's still going on in the background. Mm -hmm. But it's going, okay, well, what, what's the kind of the direct, the direct responses which, you, which are mediated through kind of maybe the systems you've already got in your head. Um, and so, you know, we, we a lot of like the classic modernist responses come out, right? About the compression of space and time and what are we doing with language and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, but then when you throw in that whole idea of, you know, what you're saying, Sahel, about sensuousness or um, hapticality, um, and that that's, you know, that's, a more, that's you want to get there somehow, you want to touch it. And I think like Mario is kind of attempting to do that in that book, in the Duppies book. He's, he's trying to say, okay, I'm, I know this kind of modernist canon. I know this kind of, this language poetry and this lyricism and so on. Um, but as a, as a kind of radical black modernist, I'm positioned differently. And then he encounters Grime. He's like, okay, well, let's, 
what are we going to do with this? Um, and, you know, it's an attempt. I don't think it's like a, I don't think he fully pulls it off. But it's, it's really, it's a really interesting book. Um, it's a really interesting way of doing it, right? Um, and just the thing on, on the silence, um, I mean, Dan Vee will probably know, talk about, a bit about this more with, because um, through, through, the, through Eddie George, because he has a whole, he has a whole radio show on silence. Um, but what, what's interesting is the, the, the track Mark um, came out on her album, I think a third album, Frozen, and it comes with the silence. So you, you and it's the longest track on the on the album, and you have to sit there for nine minutes in in the silence. So you know there's a, there's a clear um, kind of John Cage thing going on there, um, and the John Cage thing, as I think Eddie George kind of argues, is around question of queerness and silence, and he has to be silent about it. And so there's an interesting thing there, and then he relates it to dub and. The, the silence of dumb, what's in the back. Um, but yeah, those are just some of my initial, my responding thoughts. Yeah, um, I mean, I can't really add too much to what um, Kashif and Ash said there. I think, yeah, the key difference between Klein and forensic architecture is evidence and the role of evidence. So I think actually Klein is involved in a form of radical empiricism but it's not attached to evidence. It's object, it's, 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 it doesn't have the end point of producing evidence. And I think that's the key thing there. I think it is a form of radical empiricism, but it's, it's, it, it's not locked in to, um, to, to, it's not locked into that um, evidence production line, as it were. But um, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't add anything to, to what Kashif and Ash said there. Yeah, no, my point around uh, the comparison with FA was that you need both. So you, you need you need the FA version to kind of advance with the prosecution of police and demonstrate the racism, not just of the murder, but of the follow up and the cover up around the murder. Um, but Klein's piece is also as much about the murder, but more it's it's kind of um, yeah, it's 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 broader manifestation than just like the killing of Mark Duggan, which you know, as she was saying, it's just it's just like here are the facts, um, but it's obviously much more than the facts in terms of the the cultural meaning of it. And I think so. Just one more point, and then maybe to bring in some questions around um, to take up that phrase about the um, as she was saying, blackness only operates in the social, um, and attaching that to this notion of uh, uh, of its kind of textural manifestation rather than sociological manifestation because the textural has this kind of um, unplaceable quality, but it's, it's nonetheless evident, which might be the radical empiricism. I know you're, you're all into sound, sort of sonic culture, music, and you know, dub is like the exemplar for that. And I'm wondering, partly as a way to shifting to the discussion of art, I know you kind of like, drew in the, the filmmakers from 70s and 80s particularly, but whether for you sonic culture works supremely well to, to kind of as, as a site or a venue for the, um, the way that this textural transformation takes place socially, right? Because it's not just like listening to stuff on your cans, it's also you've got to be in the space to hear the, the bass bouncing. Yeah. Um, I think Dover could say that, but can I just say one thing and then Dover could, it's just, I think the textural is social. It's another way yeah. of occupying the social. It's another way of mapping the social. Uh, uh, what, I, what I'm asking is, is that mu music does that really, really well. Right, okay, fine. And, and maybe, maybe, I mean, poetry readings, maybe. I, I was interested in the, the Hyde and the work you did, Kashif, because it seemed quite important until Corona that the, um, you know, it's, it's a publishing house, obviously. Uh, and I was quite interested in, in how small scale, I mean, I'm just gonna expand it a little bit into institutional formats, how small scale publishing seemed, uh, maybe you could develop this in a minute, um, how small scale publishing seemed a good way to develop anti-racist methods, um, but it's necessarily importantly small scale because it's working within communities, but the importance of the poetry reading in a space 
two people. Um, so that for me would be another way in which the textual is is social, but but that's it, it's in a way it's kind of the uh, a venue for um, a blackness that's both phenomenological, say, and social at the same time, and political. Because it's not reproducing like the standard representational formats of sociology and the rest of it. That, that's kind of what I was trying to get to. Yeah. I mean, one way to think about that actually would be through an artist who tries to, or I think it's actually a, an ongoing concern in at least 20th century black visual art practice. But one artist who's particularly named it and talked about it particularly uh, well is, is Arthur Jaffer. And mm -hmm. Jaffer says, or Jaffer is a filmmaker, says, well, what he's trying to do with, is, is create a black film which, which has the power, which carries the power, beauty, and alienation of black music. And what he's saying, what he's trying to do there is, is he's, well, the implicit in his statement is that there's something, black music has been, a, uh, or music has been a more generative venue, institutional venue, aesthetic venue for, um, uh, uh, a radical explora exploration of, of the meaning of blackness and the dynamics of race than visual art. And he's trying to transfer one to the other. And if you think about that, that's, 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 um, there's particular reasons as to why that's the case. There's, there's um, the practice of music, making music um, can occur in, with, greater, with greater autonomy than, than the making of visual art. Um, so there's a therefore there's a greater what you could call cultural confidence in music making. There's there's a you can you can um, generate and create music in social environments without much need for wider state or or or, or um, private finance support. Do you, by greater autonomy, you, do you mean that you don't need the same validating mechanisms that you do? Yeah, in, in I mean. If you think about dub, dub has been created and sustained through the, its institutional form is the sound system. Mm. And sound systems, as long as they can reproduce themselves um, and, and maintain themselves, don't need much support beyond that, beyond the, the, the oxygen of a, of a live event. Um, whereas obviously make, being a filmmaker, which Jaff is trying to do, requires an, an immense amount of, of institutional infrastructure, infrastructural support. So it's not only it's not only what he's trying to do. There's not only an aesthetic challenge, but almost a kind of infrastructure challenge, in a sense. Like how do you how do you how do you um, not transfer, but how do you how do you create similar conditions in filmmaking, uh, and what would that look like, and how would that operate, and how do you need to rethink filmmaking? I mean, I, I would just add is um, in a way it's about history as well. It's about you know the the, the development of you know, diasporic black music, post-slavery, etc. And those histories where cinema and film doesn't have those histories, doesn't start from there, shall mm -hmm. we say. Uh, but, but, uh, but I think Klein would be the response, Dunbear, actually. Mm -hmm. She makes her stuff on the laptop. Mm -hmm. you, you know, it's, it's, it is possible to do that. And it is interesting that we are seeing lots of very experimental uh, black work that's relatively poor image, you know, experimental music videos of one kind or another. So, but, and they're using some of the intonation and, of music and, and using the sort of, um, because the technology does enable that now. I think I agree with you. I think infrastructure and big cinema and all that's necessary. And, and that's true of lots of the arts as well in lots of ways, but in some senses, it's interesting that the work is getting made. And I think there is a development of certain types of sort of black visual language emerging in, in, in relation to, um, I think a lot of sound, but as you said with Eddie's photographs, in a sense that there's a, a, a different set of resonances, maybe it's the relationship of the art with the, the urban environment creates certain types of forms maybe. Mm. No, I agree, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, and just pick up on the, um, the stuff about kind of the press you're asking about the publishing house. Um, I think it's interesting because the live event was, in fact, it was meant to be initially just about live events. Um, and, and it was really about developing a community of, of, of writers, um, writers of color, queer writers, 
neurodivergent writers, a space for for them, for us, but one particularly within kind of innovative and experimental writing. So it's being like, okay, we want to do this, but we want to do it with there's a particular niche, shall we say. Um, but then what what that how that develops then is you know we're relatively relatively improvised, <laughs> um, and you know we develop a kind of a, a thing where it's like okay anyone who's interested under that umbrella can 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 participate, right? So we have we have you know we have usual white men you know who are involved, but they know that they're under a particular sort of called a radically inclusive umbrella. Um, so that's kind of going on and you know the, the publications came and the, and the books came and so on and um, one of the things I was always interested in was um, pushing in in different directions in terms of genre so like bringing in Dan Veer's book uh, which is you know ostensibly a critical essay um, but then also I've been working and we've been working with um, artists who, who are text-based, you know, people who are experimenting with a, te a textual practice, as well as um, sound-based artists. So trying to bring together a few things. And in one way that, that shakes up the poetry world, which is very ossified um, in many ways. And also that brings a, you know, a different history to maybe some of the visual, you know, some of the artists who are maybe more used to the visual arts history. Um, um, and, the, you know there's always this kind of tension maybe between like the form of something and the identity of, of of it right and that's kind of something that I'm very interested in and we're kind of doing right but when you do it it's 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 a leap of faith so there's nothing you, you know you you can theory it although you know at the end of the day there's just lots of emails to be sent so there's a kind of a there's a line to be drawn so the, the, the sorry truth of all theory is just a bunch of females. <laughs> um, I've, I've got one more question, but I've got on quite a lot. Is anybody, does anybody want to add anything from anybody else? I mean. James, were there any, any questions from earlier on that we could? Uh, no questions from earlier on. I think you should just go on with your question for the moment and then let's try and persuade right. everybody, you know, everybody. I, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to overwork everyone, um, so maybe we just go for 10 more minutes if that's okay with you. I mean, can, can I just add something and then we can, uh, sure. is, I think one of the things that we haven't sort of spoken about when we've taken for granted is actually, and now I'm going to sound like an unreconstructed Marxist, is that there at the heart of our understanding of blackness is the, is, is, is the problematic of capital. Right? And in a sense, there's no way of understanding the question of blackness without that, we would say. And that raises then all sorts of, which I think speaks to the music question about organization, capital, distribution, all that. And, and, and I do, in that sense, think there is some, without being unreconstructed to lose in now, there's some potential in, um, in technology in that know. respect. Right? Uh, and, and I think it is about thinking about what the relationship between this kind of abstraction of, of blackness, the abstract forms it appears in, in its relationship to its um, capitalist accumulation. And I think without that, the, the struggles of, what happens in broader order fun, it needs to be, it's a, it's, it's a deeply, deeply rich area, which is deeply deprived economically, right? That's the sort of tension in which this work gets produced, actually. That's where Black Audio came from originally. Now they sit in the art world in a particular way, or certain members of them do, and the work is different, I have to say. Work is different, it works in a different way. So I do think that, I don't think, and, and in that respect, we're kind of rooted in the American tradition of Black studies that is engaging with the Black radical tradition of people like Cedric Robinson, thinking through a kind of extending a Marxist discourse and a critique of it, thinking about that, but also the traditions of um, a Marxism within cultural studies, for instance, and, and Stuart Hall, etc., and about thinking about the materiality of these practices in those. And I think that's the kind of, it's a difficult one, I have to say, to keep it together, you know, to hold those things together at the level of, um, well, I think the level of work is interesting. It's, it's to think about 
the aesthetics in relation to um, certain capital and form. And I think Klein's very interesting in how she produces her work, actually, and how she produces it. It's, it's, it's relatively lo-fi, the way she does it, for instance, which I think obviously becomes a politics in, its, in terms of an aesthetic. But um, so I do think that that is, is something to kind of, you know, we need to, it's about, which comes to your question, which is to say, we need both, right? And I suppose I'm trying to think, well, we need one thing and it, and both is there, right? But at the, it's saying not, that I, I, so what we're saying, blackness is not everything. It can't sort out everything, right? But it has something to, something about its social life that enables people to at least survive. I suppose that's the thing to do in conditions of impossibility. I mean, that, that and I, I think in that respect, um, but it also generates, it's also generative. So it's thinking about, uh, I suppose the relationship between capital and form and stuff is something that I think, you know, um, that we are thinking about all the time, actually. I think one, one way to think, one way to, to extend that and kind of, further braid um, Ash's thought there is to um, is 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 to think to think about the question of abstraction so due to due to the the particular characteristics of black critical thinking um, at the moment is that there's a there's a there's a there's a within the thinking um, or within certain elements of the thinking there's a there's a there's a, there's not a tendency towards abstraction. There's a kind of move towards abstraction in the in the production of theory itself, and so therefore, when it's taken up, um, let's say, what when it's taken taken up by by new scholars or people who are just being introduced to black studies, um, they there's a tendency to divorce black studies from the black radi radical tradition. Which is to say, there's a tendency to 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 go towards um, the abstractions of theory um, without without recognizing and understanding that what, what the black radical tradition really stands in for is the mass or people. Right. And so, therefore, in, in order to in order to to um, in order for for theorizations of blackness to have purchase, that question of people. Not the human. I think the human is is not concerned, but people. How the how the how the theory is peopled, how people are the are the architecture, as it were, of the theory, um, become critical. And actually, the the artists that we've all talked about today are, do, despite not despite, but the very means of their abstractions comes through an attentiveness to people. Um, even Klein's work there, you hear a mass, a crowd, a gathering. Right at, at the front end and back end of it, that that kind of um, bridge that silence. In the in the black audio work, you're you're constantly seeing these kind of movement and activity of the crowds of people on the street. Um, in in dub in dub in a in a sense, you could think about the silences in dub because the way to think about the silence in dub perhaps is the creation of space for people in, to move move in. When, when you live in under constricted social conditions and constricted geographical conditions, which, which the geographical and social constrictions move together, then the ability to gather in a space and, and dance, but not only gather in a space and dance, but to have aesthetic space, stretches of silence and depth, the creation of depth within constricted space, right? That, that's what the dub record is doing. Those, those stretches of kind of echoes and silence are giving the dance floor a social space in which to dance. The, the, therefore, when you hear something like a King Tubby record or a Klein record, that space is not only a space of contemplation, it's a space for movement. It's keeping the space for people to, to, to be the engine of history, to be the engine of, 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 of the theory. And I think you have to keep that in mind. No, keep it in mind, it has to be the, the, the driving engine of the, of the thinking and the artistic production. If you lose touch with that, then I think it's it's over. And I, I, to return to the forensic architecture question, I don't think people are the are the are the uh, peopling. It's an art without in the absence of peopling, right? People get cut out for the purposes of evidence, and I think that's that's the and that's what I agree, concur with Ash that 
um, it's already there in someone like Klein. It's already there in someone like Eddie George's work. The evidence, the evidence for what happened to Mark Duggan is already in Hansworth songs, if you want to think of it in those terms, right? It's there. We know what it is. The question is, what do we do about it, right? And that's the, that's the question. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. For now. Ash, if you want to come in. Um, I don't think I have that much to add, really. No. All right. I think I was going to take up this issue of abstraction, because, I mean, you will be familiar with, I'm sure there's, I mean, you, you cover it in great detail in the new formations piece. Uh, but, but um, so, you know, the, the usual criticism of abstractness is that it's opposed to lived experience and the kind of uh, visceral truth of, of being black. Um, but the way you're setting it up, it's not that abstractness is opposed to lived experience. It happens through and as a form of lived social experience. And as, as I'm gathering from like this, the, the discussion here, um, it, it's a bit like the aesthetic isn't, isn't, isn't quite the right name, but let's call it, I mean, I was saying earlier the textural and the kind of modifications of like received forms of lived experience. Is, is, that, is that closer to what you mean by abstraction? Yeah, totally, I would say so, yeah. Okay. I mean, there's a way of thinking about it would be Cobin and Mercer, the um, um, art historian, talks about discrepant abstraction. Um, um, and I think that's a good way of thinking about it. Um, like something that always emerges from the, from the, the discrepancies of, of uh, it's always there in the discrepancies of, of everyday lived experience that there's not, as you say, it's not a, there's no need to draw a distinction between the two. Those distinctions, like the distinction between aesthetics and politics, is mm. a is a is a red herring. Is you're going down the wrong you're going down the wrong path there. Um, All right. So my final final question, the one I've been trying to get, is <laughs> like picking up comment of Ashes earlier on that um, you know that you you said maybe in passing, but we had a little pre chat about it as well. Uh, you know, the university and the art gallery aren't able to do this work fully. All right, so there's two questions. One, why not? Presumably because they're caught up in, in the kind of capital reproduction system and sort of reimpose forms of whiteness. Maybe, I don't know. But I guess the, for me, the kind of, um, the, the kind of uh, more pressing question in a way is like, what, what are the demands to be placed on the university and the art gallery? to enable more, more of this, um, what's called black abstraction? Again, large question. Yeah. I'm not really expecting you to kind of come up with a 20 word answer. Yeah, well, <laughs> just, some, just some initial thoughts if yeah, you have well, them. No, no, we'll do it in a minute. We can do it, right? It's, um, right. We would, I don't think you ask the university. You don't, you don't ask the university to do anything. Really, we, in a way, if anything, we, we should be the university. And I think the problem is we have a kind of infrastructure in place that prevents us from doing the thing that we do in a way, uh, or making a difference to the thing what a university does. So um, I'm not against the university, but I suppose it's sort of um, at this present conjuncture, it's, it's a kind of reactionary position, the university is. And in one sense is we've got to carry on doing the work wherever we can do it. If it's inside the university, so be it. Maybe the conditions will create another form of hegemony and we can ch change it. But I suppose I would say, you know, sort of it maybe it's a difficult moment, but that does create, you know, it's it, interesting that I think some interesting thought at the moment is we being led by the artists ourselves at the moment. It's actually probably in Britain, the more interesting thought that's occurring is outside really of the university, we would say. And, and I think, that's interesting. That's interesting. And there's lots of socialization and study groups and all that stuff happening outside, which I think is way more interesting than what the university could even do with that, because it kind of formalizes everything. You have to mark it. You have to sort of, you know, it's a league table and all those sorts of things. All those sorts of things have to go. But I don't, you know, that's a long battle. We're not going to, 
but we're not going to, I personally, and maybe I'm just old, ain't going to wait for the university to sort of change. We put pressure on it. I agree, you put pressure on it, but not necessarily to ask for certain things because the university will even give you those things in a way it wants to give it to you. Mm. So, you know, in a way, I think we have to change what education there is. I mean, it's a much bigger battle, right? It's the schools, never mind the university. You know, I suppose we've got to start somewhere. And I, I, I think, think there is some interesting, but you know, this is a really rapturary moment in all sorts of ways, educationally, that, you know, it is kind of the, the re-establishment of an elite university structure with the, 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 the former polytechnics basically not doing anything, basically vocationally orientated. And I'm not anti-vocational, it's just that the hierarchy that gets constructed between these two and without actually the sort of experimentation of cultural studies that was developed in those spaces. So I think it's a difficult moment, but I think there's lots of interesting stuff happening, as you know, and, and it is inside and outside the university and stuff. The question is, how do we articulate that? But who's the we and how is it articulated? At what level are we kind of operating at? You know, and I think that is much more difficult. I think, you know, there are, there's lots of good stuff happening. I'm not, I'm not saying, I think they need to give, you know, um, you know, people that, interesting people, a lot of money to do stuff. But I mean, I think the university is kind of, I think it's not even, um, I think the university has a tension now between mass education and its elite education. There's this distinction between a certain kind of mass education that has to be dumbed down kind of mode. And, 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 and I suppose we would still defend, I think, and this is maybe where we come back in and to say, you know, black and Asian working class kids need theory. You know, they need to be, they need, we need thinking, we need thought. And, and I suppose that's what we're in a little way trying to say that, that we're all sort of learning. And actually lots of, I used to teach at East London and lots of the kids come up with lots of capital of loads of ways, but we have to talk about the value of theory and what, what you're doing is theoretical. So I think it's kind of a lots of layers. I don't, of course, there's no direct response to the university, but is it a kind of, I don't even know if it's in a crisis actually, because I don't think it knows that actually. It's in fact going the, in a way is using, shall we say COVID and a certain kind of crisis as an opportunity really. Uh, and, and I think that that's a long drawn out battle and I'll shut up now. I've got nothing else to say, that's it. I now should not work at any university as well. Uh, <laughs> but what do you think, Sahel? What's, what would be, you know, just bouncing it back, really? Um, so, so working at such a radical institution as Goldsmiths is, isn't... Like my colleague down here. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, it's it's a it, it's the combination of art gallery and university. I mean, obviously, these are kind of stratified mechanisms, and there's a you know, in large part, they captured towards reproduction of dominant capital, hegemonic forms, all of that kind of stuff. But there are places and institutions which are you know, wanting to to do the transformative work, or or um, endorse and, and welcome transformative work. And of course, we'd like to think ourselves as that, but it, we're, we're very limited and also uh, have inherited habits that get in the way. Um, so it's, it's partly there's a lot of self-examination if, if, if you want to do the kind of work that we're doing, but, but there's a kind of institutional limit, block, habit, something like that. So I think my, my question was, so I, I do think there are places where it, where it can happen, um, usually in partial ways rather than complete ways. So I was interested in terms of like the people on the program, you know, I think there's, there's a general commitment to challenging whiteness. We've not really spoken about whiteness, but for me, it would be the untransformed version of social reproduction, the received aesthetic model, so on and so forth. Um, so, so I think, there's a, there's a general broad commitment towards challenging whiteness, um, but, but then people run into institutional forms, like an institutional imperatives. Um, and I think one of the, the, in a way, the university is the easy one to see. The harder one, in some sense, is the art gallery, the art system. Um, and so I was interested in other forms of collaborative making and this form of abstract sociality 
and how people do that together, which is why when Danvi suggested Kashif to come in from AC Press, I was really excited. So I thought, mm -hmm. oh, you're doing it. <laughs> you've done it. You established it. You saw the need. You did it. You've you've done something, and it kind of it works really well. I mean, you, you read the stuff on the on the high yeah. blog thing, and it's kind of like a, an amazingly rich place for communication, discourse, cultural production, and theorization. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, a really great model. Um, but it's interestingly not hap it, it, it's happening in the literary space. So I was wondering what how how that could serve as a as an example, as a leading example for people yeah. working in arts. Yeah, no, I think like if I put on my kind of yeah, that hat and certainly my freelancer hat as well. Um, there's this thing around, you know, if you want to talk about challenging whiteness, there's a thing around diversity, right? Diversity becomes this big thing. Um, and you know, a lot of our money has come from arts council. Um, at least that's what's allowed us to expand. Um, certainly in terms of um, the online stuff, because the online stuff is all for, for free. Um, and, you know, it's all free to access. And we pay our writers as well. That's one of the big things that we try and do, because it's a kind of, you know, if you want to develop communities, you need to develop um, some form of sustainment, economic sustainment. Um, and what what we're always kind of wary of is is falling into, um, how can you say it? Falling into a place where the work drops out, but you're very good at just talking about your work. <laughs> um, if, you, if you understand my meaning, there's this way in which you, you become so interested in getting the next job that you forget to do the research and the homework and so on to, that will actually bring something decent out of it, right? Um, and that's when it's a, it's a kind of a trap. And I think um, I seem to remember. I think it's Spivak who talks about it in terms of you have like your desire. This is some kind of inner thing that you need to do, but then you have your interest, which is which is your kind of your economic imperative, your institutional imperative, and that there should be a disjuncture between the two. In fact, it, it's generative that they're not directly the same. Because if they're the same, then then you're you're effectively turned out to be a very good bourgeois individual. In, 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 you, you know, you become this kind of hermetically sealed, singular thing. Whereas if there, when there's a discrepancy, it's okay, you, that discrepancy, you need to bring other people in. There needs to be a, you need to connect with other people on a, on a level slightly below the market, um, which, you know, is maybe the more conceptual level, the place we're talking about in terms of abstraction. But also in terms of what Danvi is saying, in terms of just chatter, you need you need that thing just below it. Um, and if you look at someone like Klein, you know she's embedded in a, in a electronic music scene, um, a black black music scene, um, which you know it's 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 nascent, it's fragmented, but you could say it's it's amounting to like a subculture. Not in the, not in maybe the 70s, 80s sense of like this deeply entrenched genericism, but but in a sense of it's it's a set of people with aesthetic, political, social ideas which have come together, um, and they're supporting each other aesthetically, politically, and economically, right? So she involves all sorts of people in her performances, um, and similarly has been supported um, by by you know lots of others um and that, you know what and she's she, you know people talk about as being very young and having come through all of that but it's but it's you know it's it's easy to say the individual it's much harder to say okay actually sh she's you know a figure that's developed out of a confluence of people right so when we you know at the press and the publishing house and whatever we're, we're saying okay we're probably all of us are going to be relatively small right some of us may None of us are probably going to make money out of being poets, right? Um, that's a very difficult thing. Maybe a couple of us will, will turn to art institutions and try and work our way there. And, a few, and quite a few people turn to the academy and try and, you know, work their way there in terms of theory and so on. But there might be a couple characters who do go, to, go through to another level. And it won't, it won't just be them. It will be, it will be like everyone's come along, right? That's, that's one way of thinking about it. I just wanted to add, really, uh, 
it's interesting we have i just in terms of not talking about whiteness and i, I don't know if the others would agree but i think it's some while i totally agree with the critique of whiteness but it doesn't really get us in, in a way what does that mean i mean what would it mean uh, to, to challenge whiteness it's sort of at one sort of abstract level it's it's literally an abstraction whiteness you know it kind of exists in a, in a kind of space that it can actually reproduce itself quite quickly. Diversity, decolonial, da 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 da. I, I think it's interesting. Klein obviously understands, for instance, racism and thing, but she ain't working the work. She's not sort of directly challenging whiteness. Her work is just producing work in relation to a set of concerns. So I do think there's something problematic if we focus ourselves to some sort of absent center. That could easily reproduce itself in a sense and and you know it could always move itself it's i mean that's the problem with whiteness it's it's the universal it's the you know in a sense so i i think while i was always kind of interested in that i, I i'm not sure anymore i don't think that's the way to think about change actually but i'm open to um because i don't know what it would mean to get rid of whiteness as a sort of abstract idea blah 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 what would that mean yeah. Uh, you know what, what would that mean i'm not sure actually would it mean less white people or something i mean that doesn't necessarily you know it's a, or, or i suppose it's about ideas and thoughts and all that but whiteness doesn't is kind mean, of yeah. doesn't mean, I mean there's a way of thinking i mean one way to think about that is is challenging whiteness a critique of whiteness is a reform position and actually what we're in, interested in is rebellion as opposed to reform because uh, rebellion is constant and incomplete and actually to in a sense we that what rebellion allows for is it allows us to rebel against ourselves and take in any yeah. fixed position yeah. and that goes back to actually ones um uh, or goes back to two points one that I, I, uh, Sahel raised about the arts arts institutions as opposed to universities and Kashif mentioned um Spivak because Spivak has this 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 line where she says well She's asked about decolonization, decolonizing institutions. And she's, she says, has this warning. She goes, decolonization cannot become an excuse for us to no longer do our homework. And I think, I think what the 87 press is evidence of is a group of people who do their homework. Whereas let, let's say in, 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 in the, arts, the, the arts sector's take up of decolonization, I think is, 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 is shows a lack of homework. It shows a lack of attention to the histories, the ideas, to the to the debates, and uh, perhaps a lack of lack of um, a lack of commitment to rebellion. Um, in that sense, I think that that's that's that 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 issue of of of, of yeah, decolonization in the institutional form is a ref, is a is a reform position, I think, rather than a rebellion Thank position. You. You, you end up with diversity programs that populate the same power structure with yeah. people of different, I mean, this is the, now the standard criticism of diversity, mm -hmm. uh, but you, you, don't, you don't move the power structure or kind of, you know, welcome or um, accept the work of this black abstraction that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. In fact, you keep it at bay and you end up with the Boris Johnson cabinet, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> Incredibly diverse, but totally conservative, and like reinforcing some horrible it, emotional whiteness. I mean, you yeah, you name it, and you give it a name, and you give it a, a fund, and you people can apply to it or something. It's that kind of you fix it, and I think that's important. I mean, I think the whiteness in everyone's head is interesting. It's like what Foucault talks about the fascism in our head or something. I think that that's kind of a much difficult thing to kind of address, actually. Yeah, I um, I think I think we're kind of heading into the point where chatting kind of overwhelmed <laughs> the format of the of a talk. Uh, we've been going for like nearly two hours. Um, I think I have to re reinvent the name of the series following this discussion. So I'll, I'll work on that over the break, um, <laughs> that, <laughs> which is great. No, it's fine. I kind of welcome welcome the um, uh, welcome the problem. Thank um, th thank thank the three of you. It's just a great. Really great discussion to end. Um, I think everyone's a bit fritzed by the term. Um, so there's probably kind of like a lot, lot of hearing and 
contemplation going on. No, no, it's fine. Well, thanks, thanks for your work today. It's great. Yeah. Thanks for great the, the thanks, series. This time. Thanks Thank for you. The platform. Yeah. Thanks yeah. a lot. Have a nice break. See, see you soon. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.